Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds from Sportsnet, about to be joined by Ken Weeb from the Winnipeg Free Press. Together, we are Kenny and Rennie. This is the Kenny and Rennie post-game show after a 4-1 loss for the Winnipeg Jets at the hands of the New Jersey Devils. Uh, a big letdown, I think, for a lot of people, um, considering what we saw from them last game. One of their signature games of the season, I thought that game was against the New York Rangers. Tonight, clearly not that. Um, I, I don't think it's overly surprising to see what we see here tonight. At this stage in the city, I uh, excuse me, at this stage in the season, I think that the majority of Jets games kind of fall into a category, what we've seen from them before, right? So so like if we go to that game that we saw them play against the New York Rangers, I put that in the category of like that game they played against Boston right before Christmas. Those games that they played uh, against the Colorado Avalanche at that time uh, of the year in, in that really, really hot December that they were having uh, th th those kind of games where when they go out, you can see that they when they put it all together and the efforts right and the systems right and all those different kind of things, they can hang with anyone in the league. And to me, I take a look at what the Winnipeg Jets did last game. And I think, you know, for me, that dispelled the idea that maybe down the stretch, you know, you have to start wondering, are the Jets giving enough to beat those top teams or are the Jets just, you know, they reached fifth gear in December and the rest of the league is going up and the Jets can't follow? That was the concern. That game against the Rangers tells me, no, the Winnipeg Jets just have taken the foot off the gas pedal a little bit since Christmas time and and have have you know but are able to go back there now i'll get into the whole idea of like what it should look like getting back there uh because i think the fact that they did what they did last game and did this game shows it's not necessarily what it's supposed to look like but i we've seen this game before from the winnipeg jets we've seen this almost exact effort output all those different kind of things if you think about it you go back through the jet schedule that that 2-1 victory over the Chicago Blackhawks where they were down and they pulled it out right out the, at the end of it. That to me is one of those games. A, a couple of their wins uh, over the San Jose Sharks, you know, one nothing on, on Valentine's Day. That to me reminds me of one of these games. A couple of the games against the Ducks, right? You know, the Ducks, they played them three times since early December and, you know, a couple of those games, one of them, they absolutely smoked them, but a couple of them, it was pretty close and then they pulled it out at the end. I I compare these because I think what's happening is maybe some people aren't saying that they've played this kind of game, this brand of game for quite some time now. It just ends up in a victory typically, right? Because what they're doing is they're playing just good enough to get past their, you know, their rival on that night. And that's why, you know, I'm not a big fan of the idea of the, oh, that they pulled out a win, gutsy win, all this kind of stuff. Like I, I, I never look at a team that's not doing the things that it should be doing, pulling out a victory and calling that gutsy. I think it's, it's, it's borderline insulting to that team. So what I see here is the Winnipeg Jets have had a number of these kind of games against teams, you know, below the playoff line. And then they run into a team like this that's just a little bit more capable, right? This isn't the San Jose Sharks. It's not the Anaheim Ducks. It's not the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, it, it's it's it, it's not the San Jose Sharks, Chicago Blackhawks. I'm, I'm repeating myself, but this is a team that is kind of capable of taking the game, stealing that game away from you if you're not going to come out and give that absolutely honest effort. So I think that this is a little bit of a wake-up call for the Winnipeg Jets. Let's do it quick. The North End. Rick one two zero four nine eight one six two eight nine. Give him the pristine roofing wake up call. Uh, any needs that you have for roofing, siding, exteriors, he's the guy you want to talk to. Uh, they, remember their pay it forward program. They are giving, donating, uh, performing a free roof for someone out there who is in need of it. Uh, if you know someone in your life that could use that, North End Rick's the guy to talk to about their pay it forward program, one 981 6289 The reason I say it's a wake-up call is if you take a look down the stretch here, the Winnipeg Jets have had, like I'd said, I think it's, you know, two games, three games since Christmas time against the Blackhawks, three games since the beginning of uh, December against the, the Anaheim Ducks, a couple games against the Sharks. Their schedule has allowed for them to be that team that plays just above their opponent and be able to pull it out. 
if, if if what I'm saying is correct and they got caught tonight playing a team that they, you know, did, thought that they would just give just enough to get by and didn't, well, it's because of the caliber of play and that's what they can expect going forward because other than a game against the Senators, and I know some people get really get mad, T-Shoe is a guy who gets really, really mad about me saying these kind of things, but like the Ottawa Senators, they play a couple games down the road. They've lost 10 of 13 games. They've clearly kind of lost the season here. That's the kind of team you could get away with that kind of effort, but next game, not a playoff team, but it's the New York Islanders. They're still in the hunt. That's a dangerous team. You won't get away with the, uh, an effort like that tonight against a team like them. The Capitals are making a push. They come after that. Uh, the, you know, then after that, you've got like the Oilers, Golden Knights, Senators, Kings. Kings are on fire. You play the Flames, who've had your number so far this year. You play the Wild after that, who you know are going to grind you. And then you get into you know a murderer's row of the Predators, Stars, Avalanche, Canucks. The schedule's turned for the Jets. Okay, the Jets had one of the easier schedules in the NHL coming out of Christmas. And now they've got like the fifth, sixth, seventh most difficult uh, uh, way to wrap up the season here. So those games, if I'm right, and they're this is a brand of game where they go into it and they think these guys, they're out of the playoffs. They're not really our caliber. We can play just above their caliber and pull out a game. It's time to park that brand of game. It's a wake up call to the jets that that's just not, you're not pulling out and, and the signs were there, right? They're down one, nothing. And Nikolai Ehlers, who is one of the guys who helps them steal those kind of games. He did it against the Chicago Blackhawks. You remember him doing it, uh, goes out tonight. They get one of those gorgeous goals. We know what we're going to be naming that later on in the show. And then, you know, the Jets typically with their defensive structure put themselves in a situation where they just need to really have one good period. And they didn't have it in the first, didn't have it in the second. Lots of room for them to do it in the third. They didn't have that. They were the second best team on the ice here tonight. So to me, this is one of those moments where it's time to park that. And if we want to get beyond parking it and the idea that the Winnipeg Jets flipped the switch against the New York Rangers, I would contend that if they did do that, they probably felt pretty good about themselves playing maybe the best team in the league at that time and beating them the way they did in the fashion they did where it looked so good, right? Maybe they got a little bit high on themselves and maybe getting a little high on themselves, there was a little bit of a sag coming into this game. Maybe that explains it. The thing about it is, if you're looking for the, the the perfect way to approach the playoffs, think of the 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 Golden Knights last season with about 15 games left in the season. If, if people remember, the Golden Knights had a terrible middle of the season last year, and then right at the end, with about 15 games, turned it on, got better, 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 better. And then what we saw from them was a team that looked exactly the same in every game in the playoffs on their way to a Stanley Cup. Um, I think the Jets can get back to what we saw from them in December. I think they showed us that they did it against the New York Rangers. But I do also think that it's not just about having the ability to get there. It's about having the ability to raise up to that level and then stay playing at that level. And that's, I think, what the Jets need to focus on on pointing to as they go forward here. Uh, another perfect example of it, and this is easy to say that, but the Nashville Predators, and it, it's easy for me to say that because they're what going to be like 16-0-2 or something stupid like that, knocking off another massive contender tonight in the Florida Panthers. But what I mean more than the results is if you watch that game tonight that they play, it looks exactly like the game that you saw them play against the Jets. Their game looks the same every night, which should remind you of what the Jets looked like in, in December. Game looked the same every night. Jets need to get back to us, uh, to, to their to how they define themselves, to their identity. They got back to it for a brief moment against the Rangers. They fall off here tonight. I don't think it's the biggest deal, but I do think it is a very good sign for the Jets that it's time to park the up and down effort. And now it's time to really start driving towards the finish line. So that to me, it's not about finishing first in the central. It's about making sure you're playing the right kind of hockey going into the playoffs so not, you're not going into one game and feeling like you're on a high and then tailing off and having a low the next game. You want to have nice, steady, consistent, just how I was 
after that 6 nothing victory for the Jets over the Anaheim Ducks when I was neutral. That's what you want from the Jets. You want their level to be up here, but you want them to be nice and neutral. Right now, it's like a stock market uh, going up and going down. Not what we want to see. Not what I want to see anyways, but you know what? We should check and see what our main man, Ken Weeb wants to see out of this whole thing. Time to bring in the man with the best music in the business, everybody. Here comes Kenny. You know, Ken, sometimes I think I just can't win with this audience when people like Dave Chappelle is, take shots at me and say, I think Rennie is drunk. Where's all this positivity coming from? When I show positivity, people are upset. When I, you know, call the team out, people are upset. Just, But it's all worth it for comments it's like tough. this from Tishu who says, last time Rennie said he was steady, he face-planted off a roof. This oh, is... Boy. This is a good one. This is long uh, memories in the chat room. Long memories here. I'll Except they don't, they're not thinking much about Tuesday right now. No, no. Hey, Tishu, Tishu uh, has a lot of misses, but this was a bullseye on this one here. <laughs> Kenny, what are you seeing here in this game tonight? Uh, not a whole lot, uh, Sean. No, the Jets, that's a, that's a rare stinker from them, uh, even on a night where they didn't seem to really generate a whole lot at times. What they did generate, Jake Allen kind of looked awkward, but made the saves. Um, special teams were obviously a, a big, big differentiator in this one. There's no doubt. Jets power play looking very flat and the penalty kill allowing an unacceptable three goals is what Brendan Dillon described it as. And good on him. Uh, this is the second time that we've heard, uh, Jets player used the term unacceptable in the last three weeks, maybe. No, not even three weeks. It was in it was in Vancouver when you and I were there when Mason Appleton dropped that. So the Jets know what the standard is. They were nowhere near the standard, and they need to get back up to the standard in the last 13 games. I think it's very simple. Uh, this is one of those that you can, you know, tail as old as time. Emotional game on Madison Square Garden. Big win in a marquee matchup. Take your foot off the gas slightly. Take a deep breath face a team that's desperate to uh, rinse and repeat. But here's the problem. As you mentioned, Sean, for the Jets, they can't afford to rinse and repeat uh, against teams because they're playing two more teams, much like the New Jersey Devils were tonight. They're playing the New York Islanders. They're playing the Washington Capitals. They're playing... They've got it all... You laid out the schedule, Sean. A lot of those teams are on the periphery, right? Yeah. yeah. Vic Rona is saying Nashville 14-0-2 in their last 16 games. Don't Preds don't have off games. Well, they had a lot of off games when they were 5-10, and 10, so... Uh, teams up and downs come at different times right now. Nashville looks like they got the perfect formula, Sean. Now the only can, you know, again, we're, we're going to get off the Nashville thing in a moment here, but just in terms of contextual matter, Nashville has been playing playoff hockey for a month and a half, two months. Can they still have that? Can they still, how many times can you go to the reservoir? That would be the only concern. If you're the Nashville predators, no one's going to say it out loud. But if you're Andrew Brunette, you're thrilled by how the how the Predators are playing. But the problem is you wonder if you peaked two weeks too soon. And by the time the playoffs arrive, now all of a sudden the tank is closer to empty. On the flip side, when a team is feeling that good, sometimes you just ride the wave and you can ride it all the way to the Stanley Cup. Get it Cup out of the way. Hey, see what happens, hey, right? The St. Just Louis, Blue, the St. Louis Blues started their steamroll. January 2nd. Right, yeah, exactly. And they rode it to a, yeah, to a cup. So, absolutely. And, I, and, and a similar team, right? Like not the most skilled team, a bit of a grinding team. Play it yes. the right way. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, rode some hot goaltending. Anyways, in terms of the Jets, uh, lots to not like about their effort. Their puck management was incredibly poor. Um, yes. First period yeah. you know, was a bit of a dog's breakfast for both sides, kind of back and forth. There weren't a lot of things happening. I think, what, the shots were 6-5 or something. But in those 11 chances, Sean, there were some ridiculous chances allowed at both ends. Uh, Lauren Brassois having to stop Nico Heischer. Uh, right out of the gate on a breakaway. Jake Allen had a couple tests, even though there weren't a ton of saves for either guy, but there were some critical ones. And for the Jets, there were two plays that were great candidates for 
Johnston Group got you covered in terms of shot blocks that you know prevented empty nets essentially from being scored. Uh, we'll dig into those a little bit later on, but you know Jets weren't snapping the puck around uh, on the power play, and they needed to as poorly as they were playing. Sean Nikolai Ehlers' individual effort allowed them to be tied, and even when they were down in the game, you people sort of must have been feeling like they were going to find a way to pull it out. Like they had those power play opportunities in the third and just didn't generate anything of real danger. So, I mean, that's the thing. The Jets have shown that, you know, sometimes when they don't have their best, they can find a way. And this was one of those games where they went to the well and there was no water there, right? There was no water there whatsoever. Um, So, you know, and it ended up being a pretty dry night uh, for the Jets on a lot of fronts. Uh, Is it a one-off? I would imagine it's probably going to be close to that. But hey, like I said, I mean, I know the Islanders are struggling. Waiters put it up there seven in a row they've lost, but they're still as bad as they've played. They're still, I think, within five points of a playoff spot. So, um, you know, and the Jets had some issues with the Islanders early on in the year from what I recall, right? So, um, and anyone who has Elias Sorokin, they can beat you if you're not at your best. And that's the thing too, Sean. I, I thought that the the self-assessment uh, by the Jets players who spoke Nikolai Ehlers and Brendan Dillon and by Scott O'Neill, who is filling in as the you know interim head coach with Rick Bonus back in Winnipeg, the, the self-assessment was, was bang on. So in a game like this, there was no sugar coating. There was no, hey, hey, no, you know, we had a big win on Tuesday. Give us a break. If you want to be a team that, is at or around the top of the division. You got to play like one with a little bit more consistencies. Um, Happy birthday, Jeff Kabilis. There you go. Uh, And tonight the Jets were nowhere near their standard. But what I saw was that one player, you know, we know one player who was at a standard, and that was Lauren Brassois, who was excellent. He's the only reason, Sean, this is not a 6-1 hockey game. Yeah, right? nine nine twenty five save percentage. Um, again, which which just lends credence those numbers lends credence to the idea that whether it's Lauren Rousseau or Connor Hellebuck, I've said it once, said it a thousand times. Winnipeg Jets look the same no matter who's in the net. And Scott O'Neill was quick to you know defend both both goalies in the assessment in the post game when he was asked about the great job that Brassois did, and O'Neill said that he was overworked and any goalie with that amount of you know, work was overworked. Now, again, before before we go making snap judgments and saying, "Oh, this is just ter- Jets are just are falling off a cliff here." It's the first time they've allowed forty plus shots in consecutive games since twenty nineteen. I think that was a stat that was tossed out on the broadcast. So, uh, this is not the norm. That has not been the norm for the Jets. Um, they have been. They have made their living this year. the The reason they are tied with the Colorado Avalanche in points and points percentage now and even games played, is because they have been an excellent five on five team. Now today they are even at five on five, but they weren't even in terms of quality of play at five on five, and it was a flat out disaster for their special teams. There, there's no sugar coating it. There's no way around it. They weren't good on the power play and they didn't do a good enough job on the penalty kill. But the fact that, you know, Brendan Dillon's one of the key penalty killers on that team. He was hot, uh, very upset in the post game show and that's leadership. So uh, Jets have been trending on the power, on the penalty kill. Sean, I think they had killed off. Let me, I had it earlier. I had this stat up earlier here. Jets going into today had given up one power play goal in their last one, two, three, four, five games. So it's not like the you know the power play, the penalty kill has struggled enough during the course of the year, no doubt about it. But they had been doing a better job. But today that's a that's a big time hiccup. And Sean, here's the other thing. I thought that even though the Devils were able to generate at five on five, they were incredibly frustrated at five on five, even though oh, they were generating. Sure. So sure. then you just flat out gave them three opportunities and they cashed, they cashed those three opportunities. So the jets basically allowed them to really start feeling better about their own game because of what they were doing on the power play. Cause they were really frustrated at five on five, even though they had some chances. Now I understand that sounds backwards, but it's not, they were frustrated and the jets kind of opened the door for them. And then basically the, you know, the devils kicked it down essentially. Well, 
I, I think you absolutely nailed it with that because if I take a look at it for the most part, it, other than things got really sloppy after that and they got bailed out by their goaltender because they started, you know, we talked in the past about a lot of games where the Jets are trailing and they fight their way back into the game the right way. This wasn't one of those nights. There was a lot of errant passes, a lot of odd man rushes going the other way. It could have been a lot worse. Um, but I think you absolutely nailed it. Like it, this is this in spite of the fact it's 4-1 and I know it's a, you know, it's like the same thing as that Rangers game, right? It looks like it's 4-2, yep. but it's a 3-2 game down to the wire nail biter. That game is right. This is one is a little bit closer than what we're looking at. The empty netter makes it, you know, a 3-1 game. Um, but I, I don't know. I just, I, I take a look at, at this game and I just think that there's, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where I want to go with this. This is a game that the Jets system and their five on five play kept them there. And it's the kind of game that's allowed them to win in the past. But what was so uncharacteristic about them, never mind the idea of the chances that were they were taking and turning it over. But this was the one that really stuck it to me. They get a breakaway going the other way. And uh, and Brendan Dillon takes a penalty. It's kind of crazy it doesn't get called, right? Like he oh the slash he throws on the his skate, stick yeah. out, slashes the skate, takes away just like the rotten. concentration. That that's a that's not just a penalty. That's a that's a breakaway, right? Like he should have two opportunities penalty shot. breakaway there. Yeah, that's a that's a penalty shot there, right? But to me, it was big then that right after that, Morgan Barron goes and just takes the skates right out from underneath. And I, I think he corrected himself at first. Kevin Sawyer was saying that, well, he was just the victim of them trying to make a makeup call. No, this was the Jets taking the legs out from underneath the guy. And if the refs wouldn't have called that, it would have been a three on one going the other way. But to me, when you get away with one on a night where your, your special team sucks, when you get away with a major, major call that obviously should have gone the other team's way and you turn around and you respond by taking another penalty within the next 30 seconds, that's a team that's out of focus. And so I take a look at this Jets team and, and the fact that they're playing so good five on five. And this is a night where their five on five structure probably could have won them a game where they, that they really didn't deserve to win. Yep. And they just kind of threw all that goodwill out of the window with lack of focus, uh, a little bit of laziness, la lack of lack of effort on this one uh and I, I really do think you look at this game and it'll go down as 4-1 and i know a lot of people will say it wasn't there but there was a real opportunity in this game the jets parked their best game for two periods and came out and had their worst in the third this is one of those games where if they just decided to show up in the third while sleepwalking through their system they probably win this one and everyone in the chat room is talking about them gutting it out and gutsy win and all this kind of stuff instead we're sitting here and a lot of people are frustrated at the lack of consistency we're seeing from these jets as of late yeah i mean They've been cons inconsistent in certain areas for sure. There's no doubt about it. I mean, they've also clamped down against substandard teams or below the, the playoff line teams. So, I mean, yeah. we'll see. I mean, we're going to learn. We're going to learn plenty about the Jets in the last 13 games, and then we're going to say after game 82 that uh, the first 82 don't get you any. But I don't think they don't matter because obviously you lay the foundation during the during the regular season the jets have been laying the foundation the entire season since they showed up for training camp so uh, they've put in the work but they're also going to be tested down the stretch and no matter what the opponent is going to be in the first round it's going to be an incredibly difficult challenge for the Winnipeg Jets whether they win the division whether they're second whether they're third in the central but they've also positioned themselves to go on a long playoff run, like you mentioned, but it's not happening on its own. It just, it doesn't just happen. You don't just throw your sticks in the middle and steamroll other teams. There's lots of great teams in the NHL this year. The Jets have shown to be one of them when they were on top of their game. Today, they were not on top of it. What we've learned about the Jets, they've had plenty of response games over the course of the year. They've got another opportunity to have one on Saturday against Patrick Waugh's New York Islanders. I expect them to be ready. This is the kind of game that doesn't sit well with the Jets, Sean, which, you know, it, not that it sat well previously or whatever else. But to me, one of the biggest differences in this team is that when they aren't at the standard, they're not afraid to call themselves out. And then they're not afraid to do something about it because that's what they've sort of kind of that's been their bread and butter. And that's a term we've heard a lot uh, from the Jets this year. And today the system wasn't there. And, you know, 
Ethers' goal is exceptional, but I, I love the fact that he called himself out in the intermission interview saying he gave up, he had a bad turnover and it led to two chances right after his glorious individual effort, his one on four a goal. So again, he is the first to point out that he needed to be better and I expect he will be better. And that's sort of what we've come to expect from the jets. Now, again, it doesn't happen on its own, but they've earned themselves the benefit of the doubt because they had one bad losing streak this year, the five gamer. One of them was an extra time, but they had one bad skid. And other than that, they've been pretty consistent. Uh, it is a long season, but this is the kind of game that is not... If with, with a few games like this, the season is over in the snap of a finger, Sean. And you touched on it with Vegas. Vegas went into the break last year struggling mightily. Nobody thinks about that because they steamrolled their competition when it mattered. But you don't get to that point unless you lay the foundation. It just didn't just happen overnight and they didn't flip the switch and suddenly become good but vegas provided the template for what the jets are trying to follow yeah they're a four-line hockey team now i would say you know you and i would agree on this obviously the jets defense core is not at the level of the vegas school the knights right now uh they're bigger and stronger you know they don't have a you know a guy like josh morrissey who, who you know is quite as dynamic on the offensive side, but they have a bunch of guys that are really, I mean, they have, I'll tell you Petrangelo, but Petrangelo, he's unbelievable for sure. But he's the kind of guy that's a, you know, incredible two way player like Josh. Sorry. I didn't mean it in terms of that. It just in terms last year, Morrissey had quite a few more points than Petrangelo during the year, but in the playoffs, the guy gets his points. He's a beast. He can play on the power play kills penalties. He's a physical force. So what I'm saying is the Jets, their defense core is not the same as Vegas's was last year. I don't think it's the same as Vegas's is this year, but they have a four line team. They have high end goaltending, but you, if the special teams are like they were today, it makes it awfully tough to win. Gotta Four say, rounds is what I'm saying. I, I get a kick out of some of the comments uh, when people. I wonder why they show up to these post game shows to talk about this kind of stuff when they show up and they're like, Oh, it's just a bad loss. Move on all this kind of, and they get frustrated that we dig into these things. I, I just don't know why they show up. Like Paul R says, can't judge the jets on one loss like this. It's not doing this two games in a row. A long playoff run doesn't mean 16 straight wins. I don't think anyone is suggesting no. you need to win every one, but that it also doesn't mean that in a season like the jets are having right now in the middle of this, that there's not things to talk about in the middle of a loss like this. So people who will get bothered by this and want to bury their head in the sands, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Uh, Ken, uh, neither of us uh, doing very well on the Vittorio Rossi front here tonight. I wore suits like crazy down south and I just couldn't do it again. I was thinking of doing like the tuxedo night here when I got home, but uh, I didn't even get it on my plane pants. Which should have like, done a should have done a little better hat, a better job in the hat, though, buddy. Yeah. Come on. I am higher. What, I don't even know what to aim say. higher. It's, it's a it's a it's a good looking aim hat. Higher. That's all I need. It's all I need to say. But anyways, uh, it's not as good looking as a suit for Vittorio Rossi. Rossi. Uh, so if you want to aim higher, as Ken is saying, you can't aim any higher than the folks at Vittorio Rossi. Head on down there to Corden Avenue. Walk in, loudly proclaim Kenny and Rennie sent you. Ask for Frankie and the boys, and they will do you up right. You want to give Sweet Lou a shout out before we move on? Yeah, right on. Uh, for folks who have realty needs you'd like to have met, contact Lou Ferlin at Rolla Page Dynamic Realty. 204-791-9971 or at the office, 204-989-5000. His email is lou at louferlin.ca. That's L-O-U at L-O-U-F-U-R-L-A-N.ca. Lou Ferlin, excellent realtor, excellent human being, and excellent supporter of the community, including this podcast, for which we are um, thankful. Tell Lou, Kenny and Rennie sent you when no you doubt. get in touch with them. No doubt. Um, I wanted to bring this one up here quickly, and that launches into the new one. I know I said that about the Jets not finding their consistency, and yes, they did win three straight games. I, you know what? I people are right to call me out on that. I think I fell into a little bit of the idea that I just didn't think that there was a lot to see in those two games against the two opponents that they blew out before that. But yeah, they had won three in a row, and even now they've won four of their last six games. A point six 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 point percentage is going to get Get you very very far so i'm right to be called out on this uh three to four, Rat seven river fifty. Rebel three to says, four, seven, uh, 50. so i said four of six. Oh, oh i'm sorry okay gotcha you want to check that math 
No, you're good. Rat River Rebel <laughs> says, laugh my ass off. 55 just had a hat trick. I wanted to get into this because I've said this in the past about games where we've talked about, you know, Connor Hellebuck making the big save at the right time. And I say, if you're going to say that, we're going to go down that road. We got to go down the road when he did let in the goal at the improper time. This is one of those ones where last game we really gave uh, Mark Shifley the the the, the praise. Uh, we gave him his flowers. Mark he treatment. On the shoulders. Uh, and he went out and he had that hat trick and he did it against a team full of stars and he went out that game and said i'm the biggest star here guys sorry on a night where mark shifley wants to be the biggest star on the ice he's going to be the biggest star on the ice this is a night where hughes uh was the big star on the ice and while i didn't think mark shifley had a terrible game uh i just thought that it was necessary to point out that uh, you know a game after we talked about him elevating his game and being the difference maker against an opponent uh, it was the best player on the devils that did that on this night yeah and it's interesting uh, to be honest I, I didn't i mean he hughes was able to generate a bit at five on five but he was just a wizard on the power play and and again, when the Jets scored three on the power play, we point out how great they looked on the power play on the night when they scored three. But on a night where the Devils power play scores three and they're moving around all the time. Like when we talk about stagnant power plays and the Jets not moving, look look at all the motion in the in the power play for the Devils today, right? That that's that's when the Jets are clicking, that's what they look like also. Uh yeah, Hughes was the best center on the ice today. It's not right. I mean, that's what it was. I mean, Mark Scheife has been great against a lot of teams. He's been great against Na uh, the devils during the course of his career. Um, I think I had the stats today in the, in the, uh, in the mighty warm up here. I mean, Mark Scheifele has been dominant in his career against the devils, but today it wasn't his best. I mean, that that's, that happens. It's the way it goes, and you know he turns the page and tries to be better in the next game. But uh, we get that. But we're gonna we're gonna be breaking things down. The Jets, the Jets' top line was all over the puck the other day. Alex Iafalo puck hound. Today he had a couple good. They had some good shifts for sure. I mean Kyle Connor, you saw the exasperation on his face, Sean, with that play in front where Shifley got him to the puck and he batted it out of the air. Air. And it kind of just another one of those saves where it just kind of hit Jake Allen. I mean, he was frustrated. Mark Scheifele played a ton tonight, 23 minutes and 10 seconds. He had three shots on net, but he wasn't as dominant as he was the other night against the Rangers. And that's all we're saying. Mark's having a great year. No one has changed their opinion on the year that he's having. But today, their line didn't generate the same type of looks <laughs> as they did the other night. And, and that's the way it goes. Sean, Sean Monahan has been an absolute dynamo in the circle since joining the Jets. Today, he was showed that he was human. Five out of 20, 25% in the circle. You don't see that very often, and I bet you're not going to see it again this year. But today, it wasn't very good. Um, that's just the way that it is. I mean, Tyler Toffoli's been absolutely outstanding for the Jets, uh, especially in these last four games, where he, or last three games where he had four goals and six points. It wasn't his best game, but that's that's the way it goes. Today, to Foley, 17 shifts for 1755, two shots, five attempts. Um, now again, we're, this wouldn't this wouldn't have been a crazy emotional game from he spent you know six months with the Devils. It's not like he's been there for 12 years or anything. But he didn't he didn't like the way it went this year. No. He produced, but the team didn't produce, and the coach got fired. So he would have wanted to have a better game. Um, but again, you're not going to be great every night. We get that, but there were too many jets today that weren't good enough, Sean. And that's, that's basically why, uh, we're discussing these things. No, no one's discounting what happened on Tuesday, but again, that's just the way it goes. Um, and again, let's get into the lineup a little bit. I mean, some people seem to be all riled up about Colin Miller. I mean, what did you see from the jets third pairing today? I don't know. I, I, someone said that they thought it was meh 
uh, that that they would they would have described his game as man i could see that um in in the conversation that we've had about the sixth defenseman and you know getting in and trying to win your spot going forward i didn't see anything from his game that would make me think well you got to keep you know the other guys out of the lineup right like this is and, and you know the difference here you know in defense of colin miller is he's walking into a new team new system all these kind of things i would think it's pretty difficult to get your feet under you with a new team and a new system when you don't get in and just get those reps over and right. over again so if you're a guy who's being brought in as a sixth slash, slash seventh defenseman um and and you're, you're basically like don't have a, a number of games to to get up to speed for what your new team is doing i think it can be difficult but that that's that role right i yep. said this in the past that's that role for we talked about this with logan stanley i've said this with logan stanley his job is to get in there and every night give them a, a reason to not take him out of the lineup i go back and i say i think nate schmidt has done that the best out of all those players uh so for me i mean if i'm a coach I, i'm wanting to see him pop i'm wanting him to to get beyond what i'm talking about right you know i'm maybe making a little bit of an excuse for a player i think it's legit you know you're coming in and you're trying to figure this out but at some point the nhl is all about finding a way and the best players in the world finding a way to make sure that they stick i just i didn't see that from colin miller tonight what'd you see yeah, I thought he was fine. I mean, I didn't dislike his game. I didn't think it popped, like you said. I mean, the one thing that 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 we know about Colin Miller, I mean, Sean, there there were people that wondered if Colin Miller was being brought in to be a second pairing defenseman. And and when you and I were quick to say that he was brought in to be a support for Nate Schmidt, people were like, "Oh, what do you mean?" I mean, look at his analytics. Look at you know, look at the career he's had. I mean. Today he played 1641, 23 shifts. That that's a that's a busy night for a guy who primarily plays on the third pairing. Now, I think he killed a couple extra penalties here today because a couple were called on defensemen. So, I mean, that got his minutes up a bit. Uh physical, I mean, he wasn't credited with any hits, but I saw him certainly making some contact with people, but yeah, 205 on the penalty kill which that wasn't, there was an impact there. And another thing too, he blocked a shot with his left wrist. So I'm guessing that probably had a little bit of an impact in the game. But like you said, I mean, people have been asking, I mean, is, is Colin Miller the number six? Well, right now, Colin Miller is the number seven guy. Yeah. The Jets dressed their top six in the game against the Rangers. And as you mentioned, I mean, it's a tough position to be in because you're right. You don't really have a whole lot of, there's no real grace period Um for when you get your opportunities. I mean, just ask Logan Stanley uh, over the last couple of years what it's been like, right? I mean, that was a guy who was in the opening day lineup at the start of last season's opener for Rick Bonus, and now he's number eight on the depth chart. Um, Colin Miller did get some power play time, so good on him. Uh, Scott O'Neill touched on it in the pregame show with Paul Edmonds that, uh, you know, in a, in a time when a, a, team, a guy goes back to play his old team, you want him in there. I think it was the right play to have Miller in the lineup. Um, I certainly don't pin this on Colin Miller the way the game went. I mean, I thought he was fine, but I also think that Nate Schmidt should be back in the lineup on Saturday against the Islanders. Now, I do think it's important for Colin Miller to be around the Jets. And I think that, again, I was saying this with Hustler uh, earlier today, Sean. I mean, players never want to do it in real time at this stage in their career, but an element of load management, I think, is a smart call for the third pairing for Nate Schmidt. I mean, having having a little bit of a rotation, but at the same time, we're, the Jets are also at a situation, Sean, where they also want to have stability on the pairing and they want those guys that are going to be together in game one to be ready. And I mean, again, that pairing has been together throughout the course of the year. So they're not too worried uh, about the fact that they, you know, it's not like they need chemistry, but I think it's important to keep getting Miller some games. Uh, but at the same time, right now, I think, Nate Schmidt is the number six guy. And, and again, you and I have talked about this a lot. That's what the scouts and other from outside the organization were saying when Colin Miller was acquired. These are both guys that the Jets, I, I think if they're going to want to go on a long run, they're going to need both guys to be going at certain points. Sometimes you're going to need them in the lineup together, I would imagine. But right now, Nate Schmidt is the number six guy and Colin Miller is 6.5 or seven or whatever you want to call him. 
Um, I just wanted to touch on something quick here. Uh, earlier on, BA Split has asked about could they just be tired, and uh, I had said uh, no, or I'm not going down that road. And he's like, "Why nine games in 14?" And Greg Livery Pool uh, says nine games in 14 days, Rennie. That's brutal. Like, listen, and, and maybe I'm missing this. Maybe BA Split, you're the kind of guy who shows up and does this. But when I see people in the chat room doing this, it just screams and stinks to me of lame excuse because I don't remember you guys running into this chat room and on nights where teams came rolling in and were in in similar grinds of a stretch and the Jets beating them, you guys being like, yeah, but oh boy, the other team's probably tired. Um, like, or never mind the fact that the Jets have had a very wide, never mind how I'd said down the stretch here, they've had one of the best since Christmas time schedules out of any team in the NHL as far as difficulty of opponent. But the fact that they had so much wide open time, we knew it was going to be a grind towards the end of the season, but I didn't see BA split or Greg Liverpool or other people who are always leaning on this excuse all the time coming in here and being like, well, yeah, we're playing okay, but we've got a pretty cakewalk of a schedule right now now so i guess for me the schedule is the schedule everyone is going to go through busy spots and short spots and i just I, I i just think that when people come in and talk about a team being tired if they're playing tired right now it means at some point in the uh, in the other part of the season there was an opportunity for them to make hay so these i, I these excuses stink to me. I don't like them. You can get as mad as you want about the idea that we don't sit there, but I'm not going to sit there every time the Jets have a, a, a busy stretch of hockey and be like, they're tired. They're just not there. Listen, if they can't make it work nine in 14 days, they're probably going to get a little bit tired in the grind. So if you are right, and the Winnipeg Jets are falling off right now because they're tired, then I don't think that bodes very well for them come playoff time when the real grind of the season is going to be kicking into effect. Um, yeah, Ken, just quickly on that. I just, I mean, I do think that yeah, I'm with you. I mean, the Jets also played some of their best hockey when they had their toughest schedule in December, right? They were playing every other night. Totally and they got agree. Into a great, great rhythm. Point. Now, great point. again, I, I do think for context, yes, there will be times where they don't have their best or they don't have the same amount of fuel to topped up that that's true but i mean it goes both ways right i mean that's everyone knew that this was 17 and 31 that is absolutely the busiest stretch of the entire season for the winnipeg jets but if you want to win four rounds and 16 games when april 20th starts teams have to power through that and they know that so uh, yes i mean mentioning it for context fine but it, it can't be when the jets play great when they're busy yeah, no problem. And when they don't play well, it can't be just that they're tired. I mean, that that won't fly. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, the Jets are also too, like the Jets are six and one in the back end of back-to-backs. The game, they're supposed oh, to be they're, tired. Exactly. And this the, Rangers, the, the Rangers they're haven't lost. They're not a team that has showed that they, that they fall to that. They're a team that shows that they rise to the occasion in those moments. Yeah, so anyways, it's it's... We can we can move on from that for yeah, sure. We can move on. Uh, I wanted to um, point to the Nick Ehlers play, which we're probably going to point to again, uh, and just uh, what a gorgeous play that was, and just the recognition yep. that he had, and, and the beauty of this. And we're going to break it down again, so I don't want to dig too much into it. But he knows he's got a tired Devils team on there, and he fakes them out right because he takes the puck and he yeah. starts skating back towards his end, and he waits to see them get sleepy, and then he button hooks and goes straight in. Yeah. I just think that, that that is one of those like deceptive little things that happens in a game. It really, really paid off on that goal. And if you're looking to pay off high interest credit cards or debt, we suggest you go talk to our friends at Cambrian Credit Union about their payoff loan. They can show you how taking out a loan to pay off your debt actually gets you debt-free faster. And you can save thousands of dollars. Go to cambrian.mb.ca to book an appointment online. Ken, uh, any place you want to specifically go right now? I mean, you dug into Tyler Toffoli a little bit. Like, it, uh, Just give me an idea of where you think these last two games say he's at with the Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, I think he's still in a good place. Like, I, I still thought that there were tons of things, even in a game where Tyler Tyler's just been so noticeable like making crazy great plays all the time that I just don't think he was as impactful today. But Sean, the one thing I loved about Toffoli's game, I loved his ability to play along the boards and just keep like, we always hear Rick bonus talk about players who 
are patient and hang on to the puck. I, I loved some of the plays he made along the walls today, whether it was five on five or on the penalty kill. Um, I just thought that there were still some some opportunities where I really noticed him do some of the sort of subtle things that don't end up on the score sheet. I just didn't find him. You know, yes, he had a great he had one really great chance where he got set up. I think it was by Sean Monahan. Allen made it, you know, kicked out the leg, made a great save. I just thought that, I mean, he had been so dangerous in the last little while here. I didn't think that that line had as much. Yes, they had a, you know, it was a blended shift when Ehlers scored. That's what I'm saying. I just didn't think that that line had the same uh, panache in the game. Now, again, people say, well, Ehlers had a highlight reel goal. Well, he was out there with Shifley. That wasn't with his regular line. It was a blended shift. So I just didn't think that at five on five, that line had been as dominant as they have been of late. But I still think that Tyler Toffoli and Sean Monahan are like two of the best trade deadline acquisitions in the entire league. Um, but I mean, again, today I just didn't think that they popped at the same level. But again, they have played well enough that I'd be willing to cut them plenty of slack. I just didn't think that on a game. This is what this is what I'm trying. This is my long winded way of saying on a night where the Shifley line wasn't dominant. They've often had that one B line has been there to pick up the offensive slack at five on five. And I didn't think that either line was able to do that today. And also too, the Lowry line had a tough matchup and I didn't think that they had enough offensive zone time shifts where they were really churning Sean. That's something that they've done so much and so well this year. I didn't think any of the top three lines really were able to generate much. And the other thing too, in the second period, Sean, we've talked about this. When the Jets struggle at five on five, it's a simple answer. Their four check is not going, right? On a day like this, the Devils have a beat up defense core. With all due respect to the guys that are trotting out there, Brendan Smith played, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, I'll get the total here. He played 1925. This is, you know, again, Brendan Smith is a first round draft pick, been in the league a long time. This is not a first pairing defenseman in the National Hockey League right now. And I'm curious, sorry, I meant to ask you this while I'm still thinking about it. I never thought about it at the time, but when you describe the Ehlers goal, do you think that part of the reason Brendan Smith cross-checked him in the face had anything to do with the fact that he burned him on the goal? Or was it just kind of one of those things where I think it was more of an accidental cross-check. I don't think he meant to hit him in the chin, but it was it was a clear cross-check across the chin. It, it was, but it's... Uh, it but was I, hidden very well. It was very subtle, and he didn't wind up for it. But he definitely clipped him up high. Like, so if we're going to talk about Ehlers in this game, and I know where we're heading with his goal, I know what's going to be, we're going to be talking about in just a little bit here. But like, I, I thought Ehlers at that time, gener it's one of those times, it's like the Pierre Luc Dubois, the cerebral assassin. He, right. he generated a penalty in oh, that yeah. situation. And so, what I see there, Ken, is, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm not seeing it right, but he button hooks and he goes back after the defense. Like he's the one who initiates that whole thing, right? Yep. He gets cross-checked in the chin, but I, I could buy what you're selling. If the, the defenseman had followed him and chased sure. him down to do that to him, Nick Ehlers initiated. He mm -hmm. gives one of those cross checks that goes like right in that spot, that tiny little spot right at the top of the bicep where there's not a lot of padding and it can hurt. And the one thing that I know that happens in hockey, uh, cause we've all been there. You'll know it too. If a guy does something to you on the ice, that just that quick little jab. And he finds that, that, that ch chick in the armor and it hurts your response is one of two things. Either you're the kind of player that crumbles to the ice in that situation, or you respond and you try and hurt the guy back. Right. And, and to me, I just think what happens is Ehlers turns around. And I think sometimes when you get a player like Ehlers, who's not the biggest guy and he's coming at you, you're thinking, Oh, what's this guy going to do? And then all of a sudden he pops you and it just to be blunt, it pisses you off. And you see red and you respond. That's what I saw in that situation. I saw Nick Ehlers at a time when his team needed some kind of lift. They didn't do anything with that lift. But when they needed some kind of lift, Nick Ehlers went out, generated some hate, generated a response, got an opportunity for the Winnipeg Jets. I just thought it was another example of him being one of the leaders in this game. I said, I, I've liked this before. I love, yeah. I love the dynamics of the game and those kind of things. And I used to say, 
that when Pierre-Luc Dubois was with the Jets and he was playing that kind of game, you know, that whole thing we talked about it at one point when they played them this year, that thing where if you got your stick anywhere near Pierre-Luc Dubois, he would trap it against his chest with his arms and yep. then act like he was a Marlin on a fishing line, right? Jets fans loved it when he was drawing penalties for the Jets. They hated it earlier this year when he drew a penalty <laughs> against the Jets. Right. But those are guys who are thinking, and listen, Nick Ehlers has been for a long time amongst the league leaders in drawing penalties. This is one of the reasons why he earned the Jets an opportunity to try and create something late in that game. They weren't able to capitalize on it, but it was just another way that I thought that Nick Ehlers was really, really on the ball cerebrally in this game here tonight. Um, say yeah, my only argument, I thought that the initiation was from Smith, but Ehlers went back at him. Uh, but yeah, Ehlers I mean, is skating away and cuts back. Oh, no, fair. Right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, 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 and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make this sound like a blame thing. This is him seeing an opportunity. Like I thought that he gave him that little bit of a pop as Ehlers was yep. skating away. A lot of guys would just continue skating away. True. He turns, stares at the guy, skates into him, and then gives him a little bit of a pop, takes a pop back and goes straight down. He drew that penalty. He knew exactly what he was doing. It was a great play on his part. Before we do move on, I want to respond quickly to what you were talking about before about the forecheck of the Winnipeg Jets. I talked about their system and the ability for, for when they're playing that system to give them an opportunity in every game. I felt like what I saw from the Jets tonight was we're just going to stay in our structure. We're not going to get scored on five on five. That's what happened. They ended up getting burnt uh, with their penalties. But to your point, it was almost like they just got too passive in the idea that they thought eventually New, New Jersey's going to make a mistake. We're going to pounce on it. We're going to go down and score. And then they're going to have to start opening up and be riskier. And the way we play our five on five, we're able to more likely capitalize on risk than they are. And next thing you know, it's going to be one of these three, one games for the jets. I think they saw that happening. But I think that they just waited too long. They they were doing a good job of forcing, especially at the top end of the game, forcing the New Jersey Devils to just turn the puck over. And then they would dump it back in, but they weren't going to get it. And so to your point, they, they played a game tonight that lacked a forecheck. And that really, to me, is the biggest difference in this game. I think if they play that forecheck, it it tilts the ice to the degree that we don't see all the shots that we see. We don't see them taking the penalties that they're taking because they're chasing and just giving New York too much time to use the puck. And I think they probably, like you said, churn, turn over a couple more pucks and they end up in the back of the net. I think it's a different game if the Jets get their forecheck going. Anyways, uh, Johnson Group uh, got you covered. Play of the game. I'm going to give it to Mark Shifley, who has the brutal turnover, but corrects his own problem. Uh, hey, if you, you don't need anyone else if you can cover yourself and no doubt Mark Shifley had himself covered on that play. Ken, do you have another one? Yeah, I actually like the Gustafson play uh, early on. I think Jack Hughes had the uh, low shot uh, that was kicked out by Lauren Brassois and Eric Holla's eyes got massively big. He thought he was going to pound it into the, into the net on the rebound, but there was David Gustafson to get his stick in the shooting lane. And then honorable mention to, uh, to Dylan Sandberg who prevented, I think the Timo Meyer backdoor play also in the first period. It, both of those plays were absolutely exceptional uh, stick work for sure from, for me anyway. Good stuff. But I, I, the, the Shifley back check is, is high end also. Well, I just, I love the all out effort, right? I love the, I love the refusal to, to allow his problem to be something that he lives with, right? It's, For it's, sure. it's, it's definitely, regardless, I take a look at that play there. And I think that that play resonates to be on this game with one of the For, leaders on their team. Uh, and that's couldn't why agree I more. think that, couldn't yeah, that's, more. that's why compared I to it, Kreider, right? The other day, Kreider kind of exactly, exactly Kreider gave up Ken. on the play. Great, great, great point, Ken. That's uh, our, my Johnson Group got you covered. Play of the game. And hey, do you run a small business in Canada? Look to Canada's number one employee benefits plan, Chambers Plan, to give you a competitive edge. Chambers Plan is the simple, stable, smart choice for over 30,000 businesses countrywide. Visit chamberplan.ca to learn more. Before we move on to our keg save of the game, I wanted to point this out. Comet says, is Rennie jet lag cranky? You know how sometimes... You know, someone says like, what are you cranky or something like that? And you're like, 
Yeah, actually, I probably am a little bit. I, I think comments hey, on something. Tell them what time you got up today. Speaking I mean, of tired. I'm, speaking I'm of up, tired. What time did you get three, up today? I'm up at 3.30 Manitoba time, uh, and I'm still plugging away here. But Comet is probably on to something <laughs> here. I probably am a little cranky. Sorry if that crankiness has bled through. Uh, oh. But, uh, you know, he, hey, it's why I like to hey. establish a good guy Rennie and a heel Rennie. Because then I really <laughs> never need to hold myself accountable in any way if I'm grumpy, heel Rennie showed up. If I'm happy, you know, optimistic Rennie showed up. It says you never know who you're going to get based on my travel schedule. But and uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I've seen you a lot crankier, my man. Sorry have to you? say it. Sorry okay, to say good. it. <laughs> all right, then I'm doing okay, Comet. I take it. I take it all back, Comet. I'm sorry. I am not jet lag cranky. Okay, uh, Keg, uh, save of the game. Who you got, Ken? Uh, you know what? Uh, Lauren Brassois was just so busy in the game. Uh, there were a couple of plays where I think that he actually made the saves before they hit the hit the hit the pipe and went out or whatever. But I honestly thought he set the tempo with the with the first breakaway stop on Heisher, to be honest. Uh, uh, to me, honorable mention to Jake Allen, even though it was so awkward. Um, the the save that the save that Allen makes on Josh Morrissey is absolutely yeah. so important to the game, Sean, because totally if Allen gives yeah. that up right away, I, I know the jets came back and scored eventually, but I just thought that was such an important save for Allen and um, red river minor hockey. I think mentioned that Allen always plays well against the jets that historically that's not actually accurate. Um, this year he's been out of his mind against the Jets. Going into today, 61 of 67 shots he's turned away. 2-0 record with a 935 save percentage uh, and 238 goals against. And today he only gave up one. So those numbers improved, even though he only uh, had to face the 19 shots, I think. But historically, Allen is 8-8-3 eight, eight and three against the Jets with a 3.15 and 899 save percentage. So, I mean... He was very good in the games this year against the Jets. And quite frankly, Sean, the Jets are going to be happy that he didn't end up going to a Western Conference uh, uh, contender with the way that he played in those three efforts against them this year. Uh, I'm not going to argue with what you got. I will point out quickly before we move to the keg winner. BA split says cranky, but I thought being <laughs> tired is not a factor. <laughs> wink, wink. Uh, yeah, just absolutely. The chat room is on fire tonight. I and sorry, to sorry, that was Rat River Rebel that had that earlier. Sorry, Rat okay. River Rebel. Uh, sorry, I didn't have the, I didn't recognize the handle, but uh, welcome. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, Good I don't stuff. know if it's a he's, new person. Very I active mean, today. Very, very active. active today. I if love it. it. If he, love to see if he it. is coming in, he's coming in hot. Congratulations. Hey, and tell him what he needs to do. Well, tell hey, Rat River, if you are new and you don't know what you've been doing, you just heard Ken save of the game. It doesn't matter what he thinks, though. It matters what people in the chat room like you think, because if you share with us your hashtag the keg save of the game, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift certificate usable at any of the three fine keg locations here in the city of Winnipeg, each location finer than the last. And you could be, if you shared with us, uh, the winner, just like our current winner from last show, and that would be Sean Fingland. Sean Fingland, you know what to do. Direct message me at SN Sean Reynolds. Send me your full name. Send me your email address because you are the winner of the keg save of the game. Do those things, and I will have the keg send you a $50 gift certificate usable at any of the three fine keg locations here in the city of Winnipeg, each location finer than the the last and pay attention rat river rebel because we're also giving away a frosty delicious eight pack of lamplighter amber ale and we like to call this the lamplighter your favorite goal of the game ken what do you got am i gonna yeah, be surprised I, mean, I don't think you're gonna be surprised sorry when it, it doesn't matter whether the jets win or lose when a guy goes for the into the neutral zone acceleration station blows by the first player then juts in on brendan smith and then beats Jake Allen through the five hole the way that Nikolai Ehlers did, no matter what happened before or after. Uh, that is clearly the lamplighter. That was an outstanding play by a guy who has had a couple of breathtaking goals. It, it's hard, Sean, for me to differentiate between that goal and the one that he scores in overtime right. against the Ottawa Senators on Jacob yep. Chikrin. I mean, the Chikrin goal is a little bit prettier maybe because he goes between his legs and then... Um, you know, is on the backhand and he gets it back to this forehand. But in terms of attacking one on four, and yes, I, I understand that the Devils 
players had been caught on the ice for a long shift and Ehlers had just got on, but that's the entire point. Yes. You have the recognition by the player. Sean, yes. we were talking in real time during the game and I don't mean to get sidetracked, but during one of the Jets power plays, Curtis Lazar breaks his stick and when the puck is down low below the goal line, by the time he goes to the bench and comes back, the Jets never even noticed that they had a five on three for those eight eight seconds or whatever it took. That yeah. was vintage Ehlers using his brain, knowing where the soft spot was. It was literally a one on four and the Devils were almost all a, across the blue line, yet he button hooks back, picks up speed, acceleration, blows, finds the soft ice and then scores. I mean, it was just an exceptional play. Uh, by you know a guy who's had a ton of breathtaking type of maneuvers this year, but you know again in a game where the you know let's not kid ourselves the Devils had a couple of really nice power play goals as well no doubt about that and you know we've talked about this before Sean Jack Hughes going to the net to get his first that's a good goal right he goes to the net finds a rebound and bangs it right home but to me Ehlers provided a highlight reel that's going to be spinning around on. One v one or whatever, yes. uh, whatever is happening, and no, no, choose your choose your own network highlight show. That's going to be spinning around for a while. Uh, goals of the year, whatever you want to call, it, you know, whichever whichever you know long list of of things that are happening. Uh, that one's going to be on it, and that's why it's my lamplighter. Yeah, uh, that's. Uh, didn't he have a similar um, similar? Oh, there's one other one too. The, uh, that uh, the Florida Panthers, right? I think so. It was right before right the game. In in, it was the game. Of bef bef yeah, exactly. Right before they went to Nashville. Yes. Because yeah. I asked him about it on the morning right. skate in Nashville. Just absolutely so what is it? That's basically, that's four of those this year that he's well, for sure off? three. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Three. Oh, for, I mean, three out of his 21 are like outrageous. Th this one, this one with the, this one, the most impressive, I think, just because, you know, going to the four, it was like a little McDavid esque, uh, except McDavid, I think, doesn't wait to try and catch people. He just like blows them away with the speed. Uh, this was, I, I think, a little bit more cerebral uh, and, and just as impressive. Well, maybe not as impressive as the McDavid went through four guys and five guys and uh, a little bit there. That was, uh, and it was a little bit less loose struggle, but that move he makes. Let's go with equally impressive. No, no, I, I don't think equal? it's, I don't think okay. it's McDavid level, but the toe drag that he pulls off is elite, elite level toe drag in that situation. Anyways, I agree with you. The TCB lamp lighter of the game. That's what Ken and I think. Doesn't matter what we think though. Matters what you think. You share with us your hashtag TCB lamplighter of the game. You're automatically entered to win a frosty, delicious eight pack of lamplighter amber ale brought to you by our friends at Trans Canada Brewing Company. If you cannot wait for Ken or Ren to uh, gift you your own eight pack of lamplighter, you can head on down there. They have plenty of them at Trans Canada Brewing Company in their tap room at 11290 Keniston. Plus, so many great beers on tap. You got to try as many of them as you can. Great food. Great pizza, great appetizers. It's just the atmosphere is great. And you'll find that out if you're one of the folks who are lucky enough to get one of the tickets for the final Kenny and Rennie live podcast of the year happening on April 6th. Thank you so much again, Kenny and Rennie folks, uh, because you have made this another singing year for us and our events at TCB. Awesome. Love to be able to hang the sold out sign on these events. And you did that with weeks and weeks left to go here. Uh, anyone who doesn't get into the building this time around know that we will be having the year ender where we send her. And if you want to send her, uh, we're going to give everyone a heads up when that's going to happen. 250 people there last year. We expect the same thing this year all over again. It is the premier preeminent Winnipeg sports media party. You are going to want to be part of it. So uh, try and try and clear some space on your schedule. We'll get a hold of you at that time. Anyway, that brings me to the winner of the TCB lamplighter from last game. And that would be Dave's heavy eyes. Dave's heavy eyes. I haven't heard of Dave's heavy eyes before. Maybe new to the chat room. I haven't seen the moniker in here. But if you hear this, Dave's heavy Good eyes, one. you know what to do. Direct message me at SN Sean Reynolds. Send me your full name, your email. I will send you a voucher for a frosty, delicious eight pack of Lamplighter Amber Ale. Brought to you by our friends at TransCanada Brewing Company. It is the absolute nectar of the gods. Ken, I have been roasted not once, not twice, but thrice 
from what I've seen here in the Another chat one? room. They're on fire. I'm going to have to get out of here because I don't <laughs> know that I can uh, take the singeing any longer that is happening to me. Uh, but I just want to say you were on fire tonight, chat room. Great job with that. Uh, Ken, you were on fire as well. Uh, I hear you maintain that fire on the golf course. Keep doing that, buddy. It's good to see you. S stroking it everywhere but on the putting green i guess uh but yeah well, I had three rounds were solid or two and a half on the putting green were pretty good the last one was not up to up to par let's just put it that way but tomorrow's a new day let's go with that no doubt no doubt uh, jeff kabili says rennie can't take the heat anymore <laughs> laugh out loud. yes He's he can 100 right so i gotta get out of here but before i do i'm gonna say what i always do if you appreciate the conversations happening in this space please appreciate our sponsors who fight to keep the conversation going in this space for us that's vittorio rossi pristine roofing cambrian credit union sweet lou ferlin the kenny and rennie ogs at the johnson group the keg and of course trans Canada brewing company thank you to them thank you to all all of you i'll say this it's a loss but we've got right now over 700 people in the chat room that's a real number not the fake numbers i throw like the 19,483 or whatever <laughs> over 700 in the chat room on a loss i know losses are hard on people it's good to see uh people showing up and taking it out on old rennie here that's what you do bring your frustrations take them out on rennie that's probably the best way to handle this whole thing thank you for showing up everybody it was a blast we'll do it all over again this coming through saturday talk to you talk to you after that game bye-bye